Okay, just drop a, a one in the chat if you can hear me okay. We are streaming. Uh, I've arrived in my location now where we'll be here for the next few days. But today we're going to be talking about this warning that has just come out from an EU politician, so an MEP, member of the European um, Council here. And he is breaking his secrecy and warning us of a super state proposal. Now, when I first heard this, I, you know, as usual, I thought, hmm, I wonder if this is true or if it's just this politician, you know, trying to make a lot of noise. But as I've been going over some of the articles that he has referenced, it's quite interesting, actually. So we're going to go through this and I um, just want to show you what is actually going on here. And by the way, just let me know in the chat if there's any issues, um, because I'm, I'm using a new, uh, again, each time I'm trying to improve the streaming software, especially when I'm traveling. So I've got a camera here that I'm looking at. I've also got the screen over here. So we've got basically two different cameras that I can use and different audio just in case anything goes wrong. So just let me know if it's all okay. You can hear me okay. If the camera is actually better, it should be now because we're HD streaming. So good, please let me know. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna go on to this in a moment there. Let me just get this set up for you. Here we go. Great, so you should be able to see my screen here. And this is what we're going to be talking about today. This is the European Parliament, which if you've never seen the size of this thing, it's quite staggering, actually. And there was a document that was put out. There's a new uh, draft report that was put out back in April of 2023. Now, there's a few of these reports. They're not long. You can read them quite easy. And you can see in the URL here the reports, or you can look at the title of these reports. So this is the European Parliament Committee on Constitutional Affairs. So this is a draft uh, report, as they say. So let's just give you some context. And, and again, I always like to bring in reports from both the left and the right, or even, um, you, you know, central um, media outlets and things like that, just so that I'm not um, you know, going from one spectrum and giving a, a highly biased view. So this is from Politico, which, uh, drop in a chat, do you think Politico is left? Do you think it's right? Do you think it's centralist? I'd like to know your opinion on this. So this is from uh, the German Chancellor. So we'll give you context first, and then we'll talk about this pretty crazy thing that I guess you can call him a, a whistleblower if you want to use that word. Um, so Scholl's actually pitching major EU enlargement with reform. Uh, so he's saying to in, uh, in order to expand the EU, Brussels must first change. So this is what I was looking at and this came out earlier in the year. And he basically say it has to undergo fundamental reforms to ensure an enlarged block can still function, right? So a little bit of context here. Uh, another article then, again, Politico. European, obsolete European Parliament Committee structure set for a shake-up. So they say, under the tentative plans outlined in September 13 reflection paper, the number of full committees would be slashed from 20 down to 15, and include new dedicated panels on enlarging the EU, digital policies, health, hmm, and defense, hmm, yet again. Uh, the paper was prepared by civil servants working for the parliament and seen by Politico. The world has changed, it reads. Everything has changed. So has the way the commission presents legislation with very huge and cross-cutting proposals, and our structure cannot cope any more. Uh, the European Parliament Secretary General Alessandro Ciocchetti told the MEPs last month, our structures are absolute. Um, I don't know if he means obsolete. Oh, sorry, it, it does say obsolete. My 
uh, my mistake there. One of the motor, uh, motivations behind the proposal is to neutralize time-consuming fighting between the MEPs. Okay, so you start looking at a lot of this and a lot of what they're saying, and already you're seeing the way they're trying to lead this in the public eye. And what they're saying is, in fact, let me go back to normal camera a moment. So what they're saying is that the European Union, it's just too big and too cumbersome. And um, what we need is rather than all of these people making decisions, because they've got you know, the MEPs for each country, what we actually need is less people making decisions. In fact, do we really need all these MEPs voting on these things? No, maybe we'll just have a handful of people who will be the senior people and they will vote. So what they're talking about now is four or five people, and you'll see it as we go through the report, four or five people will be making votes. So this could be on anything such as um, vaccine mandates, for example. They could only have four or five people who might vote on these things in the future. Obviously, we had all this stuff with, with COVID and you saw how complex it became and lots of different views and, you know, following the science and all the other stuff that they said. Well, imagine this time around if it wasn't all of these countries and everyone trying to make their own decisions and looking at, um, you know, the, the, the data and, and public opinion, etc. What if the European, European Union next time around just said, you know what, these four or five people are going to vote on it for the entire block, which is going to be enlarged by that point. So that is a little bit of context here. And I want to get on to now in a moment what this, uh, I guess we can call him a whistleblower, has said. But just before that, a little bit more context. They want to create these new mega committees on digital policies. Yes, we know why digital policies are so big at the moment. The document also suggests merging climate and energy into a single committee. This is an absolute uh, disaster waiting to happen. To, to merge climate and energy together, I think is um, a big mistake for them to do that. They also want to merge international trade and development into a single entity and putting the expansion of the EU front and center in a new committee on international affairs and enlargement. However, the paper says that some of its ideas, such as mixing health and food safety in a brand new panel, would likely lead to new infighting. So they're basically saying we're going to do this to stop infighting. But they then say, and it's always at the bottom, isn't it, um, in the footnotes. However, this is probably going to lead to more infighting. Um, so this is the Parliament of 20... So if you're wondering when all this is going to come through, they're talking about the, in 2024. So it's basically taking the European Union and making it uh, this huge block. They want to have just a few people making certain decisions. The Parliament 2024 Working Group of MEPs and Senior Civil Servants, chaired by Parliament President Roberta Metzola, has met 18 times since January to cook up internal reforms that should be in place by the time the next assembly of MEPs take their seats after the June 2024 election. So this is the timeline on this. If you're in the European Union, and remember, this has all been very carefully orchestrated. We, talk, we talked about this for years now, how you can't ever create uh, change just super quickly because people will say, oh, hold on a second, what's going on here? So you have to do it gradually, so it's step by step by step. If you've ever read any sales books, for example, they talk about the, uh, you know, the sales ladder and things like that. Um, you would never just go to someone who wants to buy a car or something like that and say, hey, this new car is $50,000, do you want to buy it? They say, oh, first why don't you sit in the car? Why don't you smell it? <laughs> you know, is that comfortable? Why don't you, you know, get used to this? Why don't you get used to that? It's like, it's a step by step by step. And then someone who, you know, never thought they were going to buy a car, next thing you know, they're, they're driving off with a, a 50 grand car or something, right? So it's, it's the same principle from, from there as it is with public uh, opinion. You can't just dump everything onto people because um, if you do that, they'll, they'll notice things. So you, you do all these things very, very gradually, which is what is, is happening at the moment. Now, this one made me laugh, which is why I've highlighted it in red. They said the EU Parliament has taken inspiration 
from national parliaments in Canada, the US and the UK. Probably the three worst examples at the moment um, that they've taken the um, inspiration from, but there you go. The document also proposes axing the four subcommittees and replacing them with special committees on topics like human rights, gender equality and constitutional affairs. Okay, all the reforms from the working group need to be considered by the heads of the D of the Parliament's seven political groups before being wrapped up in April of 2024. Okay, so let's go on to then this Polish economist. So I'm going to start at the bottom of the article here. Um, he's an economist and an expert in European studies. He was one of Poland's main negotiators for membership in the European Union and was in charge of relations with the EU in several governments in the 1990s and early 2000s. He's been a member of the European Parliament since 2004. There's obviously a lot more. We won't go into all the stuff that he's done. But this is the article headline then. A super state is being created without any consent of the people. One's Polish MEP, uh, sorry, the Polish people, I don't know how to pronounce this, but Jacek, I'm guessing it is. Okay, so this is what he has to say is quite fascinating actually. Um, he explained, so he had this interview and he said that there's an attempt to transform the European Union into an undemocratic super state, which he describes as a silent putsch with communist roots. And he said it's got a real chance to succeed if it's not stopped fast. So let's just see what that is. So a putsch is a sudden and divisive change of government illegally or by force. Okay, so that's what that is. And let's look at some of his notes then. I, this is a huge document. So I've just highlighted what I know you like to read, which is the key points. So during the, the vote in the European Parliament's committee on October 25th, so this is just... Uh, last week then. The representatives of these Polish parties expressed their support in principle for this plan to create a super state and reduce the role of the member states to that of a German style lander. Now there's a reason why this is happening because Poland has been a huge holdout. If you're Polish you're probably aware of this but they've been a huge holdout on a lot of the things that the EU is trying to do. So the EU is basically blackmailing Poland, where all these other EU states got grants and low-cost loans from the EU central bank um, during the COVID time 2020 to help with, you know, rebuilding and all the other stuff. Poland didn't actually get those loans. They didn't get those grants. They're still on hold and Poland still wants those grants. So this is why the old prime minister, I think he did two terms, is looking like he's going to come back in and um, sort of go in line with the European Union so that Poland can get all of this money. But some of the, the Polish politicians are not happy at all that this is going to be happening. Um, so let's see then. We have to consider the experience with the constitutional treaty. There were many resistors and eventually under the pressure and the blackmail, even the most resistant, which was Britain, agreed. This treaty was only blocked by two referendums in the Netherlands and France, which is very interesting what's happening in Netherlands and France right now. It's only then that this treaty was abandoned. However, it was eventually adopted in a truncated form and rebadged as the Lisbon Treaty. So you, you probably heard of the Lisbon Treaty before. So the history of the constitutional treaty proves that even the most resistant give way and yield under pressure over time. Here the pressure is very great and the tools the European Commission has at its disposal are much more powerful than in the days of trying to push through the constitutional treaty. Back then the Commission could not block funds as it does today. So this is where the blackmail thing is being talked about in that it's holding back funds for any country within the EU that doesn't step in line with what the EU uh, wants. And again, it's a consolidation of power. And you'll see just how bad this gets as we continue on. And if you're wondering about uh, France's Marine Le Pen and, you know, Georgia Maloney and all this other stuff, why they said they would do certain things and then they didn't, well, it states here 
and again this is from this MEP, that they didn't want to vote for the immigration and relocation package, believing that an, a naval blockade was needed, not this type of ineffective measure. However, it's saying that they were threatened that a tranche of the Italian recovery funds would be blocked, and so she bowed to the uh, pressure, since she risked, as we know, an attack by financial markets on Italy. So there's a lot of things, and again, how accurate and how true these things are, this is one man's um, statements or opinions that he's saying. Whether this is true, it would be very difficult to prove or disprove. But I just want to share with you today what, what he has actually said in an interview. And I can't see any reason for him to, to make this stuff up. And another thing he said is based on his experience, so over 30 years of experience here. First of all, I would caution against reading the draft resolution itself because I heard with my own ears how it was said among the uh, co-rapporteurs that the resolution was to be formulated in such a way as to hide the most radical proposals and rearrange them. So even within the camp of those uh, five political groups, um, from, the, from the left, I'm not going to say that word on YouTube, to the European People's Party, they would not arouse resistance. And actually, if you read the report, it does seem like it's a very light version. There's only eight to ten pages there. Whereas what they're talking about is the, 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 the original paper, the report is absolutely huge. So there's, a, there's the main report and then there's a very small report. Um, okay, let's see what else. It derives its vision and certainty of what must be done from the knowledge that it represents the deepest needs of modern society and not from any previous recognition by popular will as yet in uh, existence. In this way, it issues the basic guidelines of the new order, the first social discipline directed to the unformed masses. By the dictatorship of the revolutionary party, a new state will be formed, and around this state, new genuine democracy will grow. We've heard this before. You know exactly where this is going. Uh, here we go. This is the word he is uh, saying. Again, there's certain words we can't say on YouTube. This future democracy, as in communism, is to be led by the dictatorship of revolutionary parties. Um, there'll be a stable federal st state with a European army, etc. Well, we've known about the European army for a long time. It is coming. It, in fact, it already exists in a way. We just it just isn't official yet, but it, it, it will come very shortly. So that's probably the main things I wanted to get across from this because there's a lot in this article uh, and it, it goes on for a long time. So Reuters then, EU approves Polish recovery plan, okay, but no payouts before judiciary fix. So this actually came out in June of 2022. So they agreed to the, the funds that we talked about previously, but not before this was fixed. And guess what? It hasn't yet been fixed. Uh, the Commission has long been at loggerheads with Poland's ruling nationalists, in accusing them of undercutting democracy, and they froze Warsaw's access to the recovery money until it reverses some of the changes they made to the country's judiciary. To unlock, to unlock disbursements, Poland must also start reinstalling judges who had been dismissed by the contested chamber before any money is actually paid out, EU officials said. So we can see where this is going very clearly. So this is the, the gentleman, gentleman, man, whatever we want to say. Maybe you don't think he's a gentleman. Tusk, a former uh, European Council president, and he was twice Poland's prime minister. Can you just drop in the chat what you think of him? Actually, I'd be interested if you're Polish, what you think of him. So he's been put forward as the candidate for prime minister again after the October 15 elections by three opposition groups that together have a clear majority in parliament. Okay, so there's a couple more things that um, we brought up here as well. The European Parliament is launching a plan to change the treaties, which if not stopped, will mean a massive transfer of powers to the EU and a complete change in the community system. The proposed reform of the EU treaties would mean a complete change of system and the construction of a super state. It proposes a radical centralization of the EU, transforming it de facto into a centralized um, 
oligarchic European super state beyond democratic control, key word. Adopting these changes means weakening the member states by reducing and taking over their competencies. So this, this goes on and on and on um, with all of these articles. Um, MEPs seek to abolish nation states. So you've got a lot of pro, you've got a lot of against. It's worth you just having a look at this if you're interested. Um, another thing I pulled up then, because I wanted to know just how happy, and you can find this on Statista, the share of respondents indicating they're dissatisfied with how democracy works in their own country and in the European Union. So this was a study done last year. So if we zoom in a little bit here, you can see that overall it was pretty bad. Uh, I think it's only Finland, uh, quite low. Finland, we have Luxembourg, Denmark and Ireland. These were the only countries where there was a, um, a low level of people who were, let me just read this out again, dissatisfied. Okay, so only, what's this, 10%, 13% were dissatisfied. But then you have other countries here, Greece, uh, Slovakia, you have Cyprus, you have Bulgaria, etc. Very, very high levels of people that are dissatisfied with their country. And then the European Union is the blue bar next to it. Uh, so that's quite interesting as well, that we're seeing this change of dynamic from the last time this survey was done, that people are getting dissatisfied. I think they're going to be even more dissatisfied if this super state actually goes through. But I, I, I do see Poland and Italy as being the countries that are pushing back against this. And I just highlighted this bit for you. Poland and Italy are fed up with the diktats of European bureaucracy, said the Polish Prime Minister, adding that the two countries want to renew the European Union together. A Europe of homelands rather than a European superstate, we could both subscribe to this. Uh, he said, Poles and Italians are fed up with this and want real democracy. We want to renew the EU by returning to its founding principles. So this is what is going on right now within the European, uh, European Union and what is being hidden. So this MEP has, has come out and it, basically they're calling him a whistleblower for coming out and talking about all of these things. So drop in the comments below, what do you, what do you think? Um, I'd love to see your opinion on this. And just while we've got a couple minutes left, let's just bring up one other thing I saw today. And that is that they're going, also within Europe, they want to introduce a visa. So if you are Canadian, American, you're British, um, they're, they're saying that you're gonna need to get this uh, visa soon to enter the European Union. I don't think it is a visa. I think they're probably just saying this for dramatic effect. I think uh, it's probably similar to what you need when you enter the, the US and ESTA, E-S-T-A, because look, E-T-I-A-S, I think it's probably just the, the same thing. I don't think it will be a, a, a visa the way that they're, they're talking about. But this is just something to be aware of. If, if you are from outside Europe and you are traveling to, to Europe, just keep an eye on this because I was caught out once before when I was traveling and I had to, I didn't realize that I had to go via Canada. There was a, some sort of issue with the plane. We had to go via Canada instead. And I didn't have this Esther type thing for Canada. And there was all these issues when I landed, it was just major problems. So um, just make sure that you are aware of this. And then finally, I believe we have a storm about to hit. It's probably hit already in the UK. Uh, let's just bring this article up. So if you're in the UK, here we go. Storm Kieran is that? Tracker Live. Major incident. Uh, you can see, you can see here there's a big storm about to hit. I'm actually not in the UK at the moment. Feel free to place some guesses as to where I am, but I'm definitely not in the UK at the moment. In fact, as I was, as I was leaving the island, the Isle of Man, it was pretty wild. The storm was crazy with the waves breaking over the road and all sorts, so uh, pretty wild. But um, okay, I think we'll leave it there for 
today. I wonder if I can. I'm not sure if this is going to work. I might be able to just show you outside the door here. This might go terribly wrong, but let's try it. Let's try it. And let's see if you can guess where I am. Okay, okay, here we go. Here we go. Is this still going to work? Here we go. Okay. All right, so let's see, your, let's see your guesses. Where am I? Oh, look, there's some language behind on the background. See if you uh, can read that. See if you can guess. All right, I'll see you guys next time. Take care. God bless. See you soon.